Coach Carval, thank you so much for your time. I'm really looking forward to talking with you. And for, for listeners at home, will you tell us a little bit about your background, your motivation, and, and kind of where you are currently? Yeah, glad to be here. A um, little bit about my background. I'm, I'm a performance coach working out of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the uh, population I work with is uh, tactical athletes, a special operations community, mm-hmm. um, NFL guys, and big wave surfers. Mm-hmm. Um, my foray into strength and conditioning was pretty, it's pretty traditional. Uh, I was a high school athlete. Uh, I was a recruited athlete, but not not highly recruited by Division One schools. I was more a kind of a Division Two, II, Division Three guy. But I really wanted to play a Division One school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ended up walking on at the University of Florida and got injured. And from that injury, it kind of led into someone offering me a, a position as a student assistant strength coach. Mm-hmm. Really for credit, just taking a class. Mm. That led to an internship, then a GA position, then a GA position at Nebraska, and some forays into the U.S. Olympic Training Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, trip to Russia, back to the States, and then uh, started to apply to different jobs. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, decided to sort of kind of go on my own. Mm-hmm. I, I actually got challenged by my father asking me, you know, do you think you can do this on your own? Mm-hmm. And I thought, why not? And so that's sort of kind of a short-term thumbnail of, of how I got into strength and conditioning. Mm, okay. Um, so let's kind of key in on that. Something that you said was kind of interesting. I, I know a lot of young strength coaches that are kind of in this, um, you know, limbo state of, of where they're in college and, and they're thinking they maybe want to take a trip and go, you know, international coaching, say with some kind of a private sector company or something like that. So uh-huh. how was your experience in going to Russia? Uh, humbling. Okay. And I say humbling because, you know, there's no fancy equipment. There's no monitoring except for, you know, lactic act testing and mm-hmm. lactate testing, things like that. Very, very uh, primitive weight rooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've mentioned before seeing benches with basically foam wrapped around with duct tape. Oh, wow. They didn't have leather benches. Yeah. Um, rusty weights that didn't match. Mm-hmm. Um in winter, the blocks, glass blocks that were up high in the uh, in the wall, it, where the wall connects to the ceiling, some of those were out. And when it snowed, it, wow. you, you can see the snow coming in, and yeah. uh, there's no money to repair them. So that's you know, if you could get somebody up there, they'd probably put some duct tape or something. But mm. very primitive. Yeah. And uh, what I learned there that the magic and coaching was really uh, on the science side was the programming. Yeah. Was what they did did very very well probably better than anybody else in the world was programming yeah and you exactly how to progress an athlete from a through z Mm -hmm. and use the monitoring techniques that they needed to to Mm -hmm. basically get adaptation yeah yeah it's very humbling when you come out this you see what sports science is in this country at the professional level or Uh the private sector is it's just it's mind-boggling yeah technology and what's going on yeah was as far as like your decision to go there? Did you have any difficulty in making that decision, or was it you kind of you heard the opportunity and you just immediately wanted to go? Uh, a little bit of both. There was timidity in the sense that uh, it was a different culture. The weather was different. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm from South Florida. Yeah. Uh, the language is different. I could was going to live with a, a host family who were uh, Americans, mm-hmm. but outside of that. You know, everybody spoke Russian, yeah, little, uh, English, yeah. So that was a little bit intimidating. Mm-hmm. What made it easy was that I knew that uh, at that time, uh, sports science was if there's there was a country that was really leading and, and had the cutting edge of, of technology and mm-hmm. not really tech, I don't want to say technology, but uh, knowledge, yeah. information. It, it was the Russians, okay. And I just happened to be at the right place at the right time, working with the bobsled teams, and, mm. you know, power and speed athletes, yeah. Learned a lot, learned a lot, but it was it was not easy. Okay, um, was not necessarily a, a first choice. Yeah, one of my professors just said, uh, my academic advisor, hey, uh-huh. there's there's this position. Um, I, I think you're perfect. You know, you you like this stuff. I, I just think you're the perfect guy. You should apply. Mm-hmm. I, it took me about a week to sit down and, and think about the pluses and the negatives, and at yeah. the end, just kind of jump. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Would you recommend that to uh, to a young coach that oh, going abroad? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, 
you're going to be outside of your comfort zone mm-hmm. the moment you say yes, because yeah. in the whirlwind of the who, what, where, and when, what's going to happen starts going on in your head, and you, you, you're automatically off your comfort zone, and that's good. Yeah. Because that's growth, right? That's where mm. growth is outside that box. Yeah. It, it also uh, lets you mature very, very quickly mm-hmm. um, uh, as an individual. Mm-hmm. Is you be uh, apart from and aside from the actual job, you have to interact with people. Mm-hmm. And you have to interact with people that um, you don't know the language, they don't know yours, but you still have to communicate the things that you need and want. And yeah. there's a lot of growth. Uh, I had a tremendous growth spurt as an individual, apart from being a coach, yeah. by making and forcing myself to to learn some of the words and some of the language and mm-hmm. just venture into the city and. Uh, it's a great learning experience aside from just learning the, the ins and outs and the X's and O's of, of being a coach. Yeah, no, I love that. Okay. And then kind of moving forward with that, right, that idea of like entrepreneurship and, and kind of pursuing your own I- ideals and goals. Um, what exactly does entrepreneurship mean in the world of strength and conditioning and how can we um, kind of attack that better? Wow, great question. Um, there's not much entrepreneurship. Uh, in the collegiate or, or, or pro ranks, and, mm-hmm. and, and if you give me a moment, I'll explain that, what okay. that means. is If you work at that level, you're working for somebody. Mm. Right? You you are part of the cog in the wheel that keeps the lights on. Yeah. And and you're not necessarily a brand. Yeah. And in fact, being a brand could actually work against you mm-hmm. because there's, there, there's a potential for, well, this guy already has a following. Yeah. Um, what is he going to bring? And worse off is, can he can he possibly take some of the athletes that are here? Yeah, go somewhere else as part of that brand. Mm-hmm. And I know many schools that are very weary of hiring somebody who has a brand mm-hmm. already, yeah. whether it's social media or their own business. And I understand that from the standpoint that uh, there's a liability in the sense that the legality of are we bringing in somebody that already has something established outside mm-hmm. these walls? Yeah. Um, and so I always tell people, if you're working in those capacities, nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. That's fine. But there's no real need to be a brand uh-huh. because you, your brand is the brand of whatever insignia you have on your polo, mm-hmm. your school, whatever protein that is. Yeah. Having said that, if you're not in that capacity with your collegiate strength condition coach or working for a facility – or an NFL pro team, or a pro team, etc. You have to be a brand. Mm-hmm. In fact, you better be a brand because you're not going to be able to eat. Yeah, that's going. You're the own cog in your own wheel. You're going to have to be able to uh, let people know who and what you are. Yeah, and what you're about. And that's that's branding. Yeah, that's entrepreneurship. You're going to have to learn business. Mm-hmm. Right? When you went to school, uh, I never took a business class. Everything yeah. was exercise science, physiology, anatomy. Mm-hmm. Um, Nobody taught me that apart from coaching people. Yeah. I needed to know how to balance books and pay bills because the lights are going to be turned off. Mm-hmm. And the lights are turned off, nobody's coming to train. Yeah. So there's a business aspect of coaching that is super important. If you decide that you want to venture out on your own and you want to be your own guide, mm-hmm. make your own decisions and open your own facility, that's all great. Yeah. Better learn about branding because you are a brand. Mm. Um, can you be a brand inside? And can you be an entrepreneur yeah. inside the walls and the com- confines of an institution? The answer is yes, but you're limited. Uh-huh. And, and I can tell you somebody's always watching. Yeah. And the moment you get a little bit outside of the parentheses, mm-hmm. someone's going to let you know yeah. that. Yeah. Not to mention that when you're working in those capacities, um, the clock is ticking. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be there probably for a very long time. Yeah. And so once you understand that, then you ha- have to start thinking about plan B mm-hmm. and building a bridge to plan B so that if when that happens you have another factor to consider and that's that's the branding that's where the branding comes in so mm-hmm. yeah I was advise people is don't don't just up and quit yeah is build a bridge mm-hmm. start foraying into whatever it is that you think you like to do mm-hmm. and build a brand become a brand uh, be more active on social media go speak at events mm-hmm. except present and start putting your name out there because if that if that's what you want to do is you want to go on your own, mm-hmm. people have to know who you are. Yeah. I think that's super important too because like you said, right, if you're in the confines of an institution, you might not be there for long. And one of the things is no matter how much loyalty – and in my young career, right, this is kind of what I figured out is like no matter how much loyalty you have to that institution, 
that institution may not have that loyalty to you. Um, uh-huh. And so that's why, I mean, that's that's why this is just so interesting to me of like branding and, and working for the institution and loyalty because all these coaches talk about loyalty, right, as far as in the college setting, but uh-huh. it may not be reciprocated, you know? Yeah, and I would I would even go say that it won't be reciprocated, yeah. right? You, you're a cog in the wheel. Mm-hmm. And there's 10 more behind you that will take your job at $10,000 less. So yeah. that, that puts you in a very, very uh, vulnerable position as an employee. Mm-hmm. And that's what you are. You're an employee. Mm-hmm. Good, bad, or indifferent, that's exactly what it's going to be. Yeah. So um, you, you have to think about plan B. If mm-hmm. you're an institution, if you're in the pro ranks, I don't care where you're at. Yeah. You have to be thinking about the plan, plan B. I, I mentioned in a conversation recently about Somebody asked me, how many people do you know who are actually retired with mm. a pension yeah. uh, as a strength conditioning coach? And I only know two. Wow. So going into 28 years of doing this, mm-hmm. two is not a very good ratio. That's unreal, yeah. That's not a very good number. So yeah. you're not going to probably retire doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, the other question I was asked recently is, you know, can you picture yourself coaching in a facility at 65? Mm-hmm. That was a really interesting question. The answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> Right, we don't see guys coaching it. This is a young man's game. Yeah, and you have to have a certain amount of energy and decorum mm-hmm. uh, to be able to you know, rise and, and do your grinding, whatever it is you do at whatever institution you do. That's not easy. That's certainly going to be a young man's game for sure. So you, yeah. you have to start building a bridge, and you have to start thinking about Plan B. Yeah, and two thoughts that arise when you kind of say that, right? Is is I've worked for someone before that that was talking about a employee that they were looking to bring in. They described him as, "Oh yeah, he's the he's the type that'll get in here at 5 a.m. and and he'll leave at like 8, 7 or 8 p.m." And it's like in the industry, it it kind of seems like we're trying to go away from that because we we want more um let's say kind of I'm not sure how to put it. We want more uh, structure, right, in our in our day, right? We we don't want to be overworked, but at the same time and it, and it's, it was an older strength coach that said this, is they're still propagating this mindset that's kind of throwing us off kilter, right? So they're pushing against what that kind of younger generation is pushing for. Mm-hmm. And so it's just interesting, you know. That conversation has changed from, uh, and it's it's been a, a slow change, but it's changing. Yeah, yeah. From let's grind 60 hours a week Yeah. to, yeah, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I applaud the younger generation, the younger coaches coming in, mm-hmm. realizing that uh, I, I don't want to work 14 hours a day. Yeah. Right? And just because you did it mm-hmm. doesn't mean that that's right or that's the way that the industry is. We, we have a problem in, in strength and conditioning right now. Mm-hmm. And it's been a problem for a long, long time. And that's the taboo of speaking about things like burnout. Right? Yeah. Those 60-hour weeks, those 14-hour days. Yeah. You can do that for a while. Mm-hmm. You can't do that forever. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that uh, from personal experience and experiencing personal burnout with mm-hmm. you know, a whole host of physiological symptoms. Yeah. Because I was that guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I did 14 hour days. I mm-hmm. did 70, not 60. I did 70, 80 hour weeks. Wow. I was that guy coming in at four, leaving at midnight and mm-hmm. sleeping three or four hours thinking I could do that forever. Yeah. And the answer is no, you can't. Mm-hmm. I don't really care who you are. <laughs> no, you can't. Yeah. You're going to break down mentally, you're going to break down physiologically. Mm hmm. And your biology is going to change completely to where you're going to be screaming, I yeah. want to do something else. Yeah. Uh, um, so the taboo is nobody wants to talk about burnout. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that they're not necessarily happy. Mm-hmm. But, hey, I got a job and I'm employed. I wear a team polo. And uh, I've probably spoken to more coaches who are unhappy mm-hmm. as a strength and conditioning coach and they're happy. Yeah. Much more. I'd oh, I agree. The, the ratio is probably 80 20. Yeah. Uh, and it's slowly switching to 90 10. Yeah. It's a lot of guys are very unhappy about the hours. Mm-hmm. The money's not very good. Yeah. Uh, I've seen jobs posted at $30,000. Yeah. When I left school quite a while ago, uh, the first job I applied for was 22000 Yeah. And I always tell a story that my roommate was a regular guy who made hamburgers at McDonald's. He wasn't a System manager, manager, just a regular guy making burgers. Yeah. He was making more money than I was going to make. That's the thing, yeah. It's and uh, the next job I applied for was thirty, thirty-five, and mm-hmm. that's like the industry standard right now. Yes, yeah. you know you're pretty close to poverty level. Exactly. Right? That's great if you're a single guy. Yeah, and you're willing to live at that level and just grind all day and have nothing else. But yeah, you know we we have this evolution of 
ourselves. It happens as, as time goes on, as we get older. Mm-hmm. And what was okay for you as a young man mm-hmm. is not going to be the same thing as it is when you get older. Yeah. Uh, an example of that is uh, I would take that $30,000 job, right? I'm mm-hmm. be a single guy. I could live in an apartment, uh, live with a couple of guys, yeah. go and grind every day. And I could do that, get experience, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not taking that job now. Yeah. Uh, there's no way you're going to be able to make me apply for a job that's $35,000 now. Yeah. That's because I evolved. It doesn't yeah. mean that the job is not worthwhile. Mm-hmm. I've just evolved to uh, my worth has changed over the years, mm. not just the worth that somebody assigns to me, yeah. but the worth that I assign to myself. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, I agree. And one of the, another thing, right, and, and this, I mean, it sounds like I'm kind of attacking older strength coaches, and I'm not because there are so many that taught me so many valuable things and that have such a progressive mindset. But at the same time, there are some that still say, for example, I had a different conversation with a different boss, right, and he said, uh, he said I'm not the best boss. Um, but I don't care. It's my way or the highway, you know, mm-hmm. and that and that's like to me is like, hmm, is that really somebody I want to work for? You know, um, mm-hmm. but at the same time, that person is the one setting the hours. And so he's setting the tone. right? Exactly. He, he is the guy that at the end of the day makes the decision whether you're going to be there or not. And yeah. So I understand the, the position where a young strength coach comes in and you, you don't get to choose. Mm-hmm. So you're going to go. It's you're going to apply for a bunch of different places and. You're going to be very, very lucky if some of those places call you back. Most definitely, yeah. And blessed if actually you get a Skype interview or mm-hmm. you know, the next step progression of getting that job. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to come in at that ground floor and you, you, you are going to be grinding. You are going to do, be doing those things. And uh, a, a lot of the profession is, well, that's the way I came up. So I'm yeah. going to expect you to do the same thing. Exactly. And that conversation has to change because that, that, that makes – that's not growth. It just doesn't make any sense to me just because yeah. we did it that way. <laughs> For three years, doesn't yeah. mean that you know anybody checked that maybe that wasn't the right way to do it. Yeah. The answer is yeah, that's probably not the right way to do it. But that's yeah. we just kind of stick as a as a profession and as an industry to that. Well, that's the way we've always done it. So yeah. we can expect everybody to come up and do the same thing. Yeah. And those young guy guys coming up are thinking, yeah, no, that's not the way it works. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't like that. Yeah. That's okay to say that. It's okay to uh, not be happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, with a job that's you know, thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, we don't get into this profession, Juan, because we, we're going to make a lot of money. No, most definitely. We, yeah. We know that. that we're, mm-hmm. we're not going to be driving around a Lamborghini. Yeah. Uh, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. You're you're going to make some money, mm-hmm. and uh, I always say, you know, fair days work for fair days pay. Yeah. I don't think anybody coaching wants anything less than that. Mm-hmm. But you don't come in this for the money. That's not what you coach for. Oh, agreed. But there's nothing wrong with wanting to be paid fairly yeah. you know, across the board. And the problem is that we keep really shooting ourselves in the foot by accepting those $30,000 a year jobs. Um, there's there's hundreds of guys that will take that job at, you know, at a moment's notice. Yeah. And that keeps us in the dark ages. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's tough to defeat because, like you said, it's it's a whole mindset of – It's very hard to. It's, it's a, it's, it, you're, you're trying to – go against a culture yeah right? that culture has been established and this is the way it is and it's not easy it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a very difficult conversation but it's a conversation that has to be had yeah agreed agreed and kind of moving forward with some more some more stuff on entrepreneurship right so how can you balance or what's your opinion on balancing entrepreneurship and job responsibilities right how can one do that better or what's a better approach to that yeah uh it doesn't exist. It's a folly. Mm. You can't balance uh, work and life. And yeah. The reason I say, uh, you know, family. Yeah. If you're going to call it a balance, right? Yeah. It's 50% would be work, 50% would be family, right? Yeah. Uh, well, you, you 50%, you can't assign 50% to your family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, they have to be 100%. Yeah. Uh, so it has to be 100%. So I, um, I've been speaking quite a bit about this particular topic in itself is that there, there is no balance. It doesn't yeah. exist. What you, what you have to do is you have to start making better choices with the available time that you have. Mm-hmm. And so for me, when somebody says, well, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. I, I hear your words, but what does that look like? It's, for some periods of, of the year for me, it's, it is 60 to 70 hour a week, weeks. Yeah. 14, 18 hour days. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that switches to um, more availability. Mm-hmm. Uh, more things where I enjoy, you know, surfing and jujitsu and bow hunting, mm-hmm. the things that I, I like more. Yeah. And then that wave comes back down to, uh, 
the off season period where I'm going to be a little bit more busy mm-hmm. and uh, I'm going to miss birthday parties and holidays and yeah. you know get togethers and things because I'm working. But there's other parts of the year where I'm more available and I get to do those things. So I think in that period where I have more availability, I, I just make better choices. Yeah. And the family family will always come first, mm-hmm. and everything else comes second. And uh, the way I've always described it is how and the reason I burnt out is that I made the mistake of trying to build uh, a life around coaching. Mm. Coaching was 99% of my life, and yeah. the rest of it was 1%. And yeah. uh, if you ask, well, how did that work out? And the answer is it did not. Yeah. You know, I had a major burnout in coaching. Yeah. And after that, I decided that's not what I wanted to look like anymore. I wanted to reinvent coaching as, as I saw it. Yeah. And so I built a coaching practice around the life. Mm. Uh, the things that I enjoyed, family came first. Mm-hmm. And I could still coach. It just it was going to be a little bit different than what you thought coaching was. Yeah. You do that work in a facility for a team. Mm-hmm. Uh, hard to say. Uh, I think you can make better choices with the time you have, but you're boxed into the hours that the employer wants you as the employee to come in and work. Yeah. Nine to five, nine to seven. And in coaching, you can put a parenthesis between nine to five, but yeah. you know, as you well know, that it don't work that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, you're going to come in earlier, you're going to stay late, you're going to work weekends and nights, and that's yeah. just the way it is, and you're not getting paid for that. Yeah. But that's almost an accepted part of the job, is that's what you're going to have to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a different conversation, but it's 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 really it's really about just making better choices. You're you're never going to be able to balance work and and family. It's yeah. very very difficult. Um, I spoke to a coach yesterday mm-hmm. who we we're on the same subject almost verbatim of what I just said, mm-hmm. and he said, you know, I I when I started I I started I grinded. I, I did fourteen hour days and sixty hour weeks and more than that. And I missed holidays, I missed birthday parties, and you know, daddy-daughter dances, and uh, I would come back, and he gave me an example of something that happened where one of his kids was sick, mm-hmm. and couldn't get hold of the mother, and didn't really want to call dad, because dad's always busy, and he never shows up anyway, so why should I call him? Yeah. Right, that's, wow. that's hard. Wow, yeah. That's a punch to the gut. Yeah. And he said, you know, I... Uh, that was life altering for me and he changed the way he did things and uh, now cuts out early if he needs to mm-hmm. to go to a school event or take his kids to the doctor whatever he needs to do Yeah. because in the end he realizes that the job's not going to be there forever but your family is yeah. so you, you cannot balance that it, it has to be um, and that, that comes back to your choice of employer Yeah. Is, um, you know one of the things I've always been asked is if I'm going to go interview, um, how do I close out my interview? And I would say, well, you, you have to ask questions of the employer yeah. as they ask questions. Of usually, they'll, they'll ask you, do you have any questions for us? Yeah. And the answer is yes. You better have some questions. And some of those questions are, um, family is important to me. Um, how do you account for that? How, yeah. how can I be more available to my family? Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody wants to answer that because they're afraid of not getting the job. Yeah. If you get the job, then you're going to be miserable because you're not going to be having access to anybody. Mm. Uh, let alone your family. So yeah. you have to be able to be okay with asking someone that you're going to be employed with, what is their stance on that? Yeah. Um, uh, it, or, or am I going to be able to cut out some days? Uh, I have a family. Am I going to be able to cut out and do some things for my family some days when, when my wife can't step up and stuff? And mm-hmm. One of the places says, you know, we, we place a value on family. Mm-hmm. And so you're part of our family. You under, we understand you have your family. And we're yeah. going to accommodate as much as you can. Yeah. That's what you want to hear. Mm-hmm. Now, you still may be getting $35,000 a year, Yeah. but at least you're looking at a place that values who and what you are as an individual apart from coaching, realizing that you have a, you have a life outside. Mm-hmm. So I, I've never thought, I've never seen, I have yet to see anybody to be able to balance those two in the past two years. Yeah. I've probably turned somewhere in the line of probably 200 coaches, maybe a little bit more than that. Mm-hmm. And that is a main topic of conversation is how do I balance this? Cause I'm not balanced. I'm not being able to balance it. I'm drowning. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to lose my marriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, my kids aren't even paying attention to me cause I'm never there. Yeah. Uh, everybody wants that. So they're, they're trying to figure it out. How do I stay in coach without having to, you know, rely on, on 
somebody else to be able to kind of bring in the money because I'm the guy. Yeah. How do I do that? How do I go to work and then be able to do all those things? It's mm-hmm. not an easy uh, solution. It's not an easy answer, but you, you have to start realizing that there is no balance. It doesn't exist. It's a folly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's this... It's this word that people are looking at and thinking that it can happen. Not if you coach. And you yeah. know, you know that one from, uh, you know, coaching yourself. Yeah. There is no balance, man. It doesn't exist. You just have to make better choices with the free time and available time that you have, mm-hmm. so that you're able to enjoy some aspects of your life apart from coaching. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And then, kind of moving forward with that idea, right? Um, what's your take on there's there's this phrase, right, that you should always work harder on your uh, on yourself than you do on your job, right? So what's your take on that? So that's just, for me, part of, of building the bridge, uh-huh. right? Understanding, okay, I have a plan B. Um, you know, how about instead of just going to conferences and mm-hmm. workshops to, to be a better coach, Yeah. Uh, think about, you know, what do I like to do? Yeah. How can I, how can I get to a point where I can build, you know, multiple streams of income, mm-hmm. you know, Write an ebook. Yeah. Uh, teach a course. Mm-hmm. Uh, come up with an app. You know, uh, be an affiliate for equipment or whatever yeah. it is. It's just thinking about outside the box of how you make money right now, so that everything can't be. Where I'm going to get a certain amount of money for a certain amount of hours a week, and then you box yourself in. Mm. Yeah. So part of it is take some of that time. I got to make better choices with the available time that you have. Yeah. And start learning how to build the bridge. Start hooking up and getting uh, some conversations going with people that are probably doing well outside of just coaching. Yeah. And have built that bridge to something else. And Mm -hmm. there's a lot of guys who have done it out there. Somehow we were, as a profession, we're. we're jealous of those guys because they're making money. They're actually making money and doing well. Yeah. Rather than being jealous and, 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 you know, kind of breaking down their walls, we should be kind of continue to encourage them because encouraging them means that there's there's a possibility that we can do the same. And the answer is we can. Yeah. Yeah, work on the job. Learn, learn how to be a good coach. But you learn, learn also a little bit about how and where you want to build that bridge. So when, when and if that day comes, mm-hmm. most of the time it is coming, yeah. you have a plan B. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So with that, right, so how do we know when it's time to take advantage of a new opportunity versus sticking it out and, and working at the current opportunity that you're at? When you're miserable getting up every day. <laughs> simple. Uh, that That's a really simple, uh, I could give you a thousand different answers to that, uh-huh. that would, you know, tick some boxes. But yeah. at the end of the day, and I can tell you from, because I went through a burnout, I can tell you from personal experience, Yeah. is the day you start getting up and you're dreading going to work, yeah. and you're dreading the drive, and you're dreading having to go work with someone that you don't like, yeah. don't get along, it's time to go. It's, start, it's time to start building that bridge. Yeah. Because that is 100% a fast train toward burnout. Uh. It, it's not when, and it's not if, it's just a matter of uh, sooner or later, but yeah. more, more likely than not, it's going to be sooner. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's powerful. And then with that, right, what kind of tips on business do you have? Really simple is learn about business. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another simplistic way of looking at it, but we learn, we spend all of our time on the X's and the O's, right? Mm -hmm. How do I, how do I be, how do I do better better program design? How Mm -hmm. how can I warm up the guys better? Yeah. Uh, You know, how do I build oxidative or cardiac output qualities? At the end of the day, that's all fine and well, but there's an other aspect of this. It's, and again, if you're going to br- build a plan B, is you, you have to learn about business. You have yeah. to learn about finance. You have to learn that there's a different world out there that doesn't care anything about you as a coach. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to crush you the moment you think that you're going to go out there and you know do beast mode. They're gonna, you're going to get crushed. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to get crushed if you don't know anything about business. So start yeah. learning a little bit about business. Okay. You have to go and get a finance degree. Yeah. But start learning, start for every book, and this is a, a, a thing I, I did and how I sort of started on what I recommend, is for every two books that you read that having anything to do with strength and conditioning, mm. read one that has to do with personal development or finance. Mm. Yeah. And little by little, you start building a library and you start building knowledge. Yeah. Uh, take some uh, workshops, 
that have to do with mastermind groups and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Um, I I did one that is probably 20 years ago that changed the course of what I did completely because I loved coaching. Yeah. But I realized I didn't want to do that forever. There there had to be another way to be able to make money and enjoy uh, the things I want to do. I just wanted to surf. So how how can I do that and make some money? Yeah. And I went to a sort of a, it was sort of kind of a mastermind group Mm -hmm. run by a guy that still does it. uh, And he he does very well. Mm -hmm. And he basically was teaching people how to make money from fitness. I wasn't necessarily in the fitness business, but I did like and want to learn more about what he knew. Like there's something that he was doing that was doing, he was doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was already a millionaire Mm -hmm. many times. So he had information on how to be able to take that niche that you have. Mm-hmm. And his thing was you, you have to find a niche yeah. and start building multiple streams of income so that you don't have to coach people and count reps. What I didn't want one was I didn't want to count reps for the rest of my life. Yeah, I agree. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's a part of my, there's a part of, uh, of the year of my life where I count reps. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a finite you know, uh, set of time with parentheses locked around it mm-hmm. and it's not year long uh, but I do count reps I, yeah. as you do right yeah as we all do. Mm-hmm. but it's not the only thing I wanted to do that's not what I wanted my development as a coach to be it's just your eye in the box counting yeah. reps I wanted I think I had more to offer the world and that course really taught me and opened my eyes to there's there's a lot more things out there than just coaching but mm-hmm. personal development in other areas business um, entrepreneurship mm-hmm. and, you know, what, what is a brand? How mm. do you consult? Yeah. And how do you get paid as a consultant? Mm. If you decide you want to do that, all those things you have to learn because you're not taught that about that in school. Oh, not at all. Yeah. Uh, you may even have to pay somebody, uh, to be able to pick their brain. If that's available, do that because you're going to be able to grow leaps and bounds above everyone else. If you have something else to offer. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I agree. Okay. And then kind of moving forward, right on a little bit of more like some mental health philosophy, kind of brain science type stuff, right? So you've had some experiences with great white sharks, right? So will you touch on those experiences and what you've kind of learned from them? Um, so all of those experiences to me, in a nutshell, taught me that there was I was a very, very small person on this planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, simple. Yeah. And the... The one encounter that I had that, that is very prevalent, it's, it's always at the forefront of my mind, is I, uh, I went surfing one morning in Manhattan Beach, California, and I mm-hmm. uh, was there by myself, and it was really just a more of a meditative kind of, not really a lot of waves, yeah. it's really about paddling and enjoying myself, and up popped this fin about 10 feet away, and it was a very, very large shark, I could tell it was a great white, mm-hmm. and he ducked under, and he got between me and the beach. Yeah. And he started doing swimming a figure eight on top of the water, mm-hmm. essentially uh, growing that figure eight enough that he was pushing me out to sea. Mm. And so I learned that there was intelligence there. Yeah. He, was, he was actually thinking that this is where I'm, if I keep doing this figure eight circle and it's wider and wider and wider, I'm mm-hmm. going to push this guy out to sea. Yeah. And then essentially I'd be a snack. Yeah. But there was intelligence there, which uh, the moment I realized that made me feel very, very, very small. A mm-hmm. uh, speck of dust on this planet. Yeah. And uh, long story short, I was able to turn the board and start paddling. I took off my leash and I just started paddling, fully mm-hmm. expecting to be hit. Yeah. And it never happened. And then once I reached the shore, sort of kind of life changed. Mm-hmm. And the way it changed was I started to realize again that... Um, one of the things I remember, uh, I, I didn't remember anything about work or uh, wasn't even thinking about family or program yeah. design. Uh, the one thing I came to mind while I was out there was, had I been unkind that day? Mm. You know, had I been unkind recently? Yeah. Um, that's what the that's the first thought I had in my mind is I did not want uh, for my life to end at that moment and for someone for for me to have been unkind to someone that day. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where that came from. I'm not very religious, mm-hmm. um, more spiritual than I think I'm, I am anything else. Mm-hmm. But it was profound that I didn't think of anything else except had I been kind. Mm-hmm. So that changed the way I um, approach people and how I coach and 
the way it changed my coaching, I was always an athlete-centered coach. Yeah. And that changed me into a people-centered coach mm. where uh, people come first and the athletes come second. Yeah. I uh, try and get trust and buy-in and learn about the individual first. Yeah. yeah. And then the athlete. And that, that was not the way I did it before. Mm-hmm. And so that encounter changed the way I looked at life and myself and uh, the fact that we're only here for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. Here I thought, uh, I go in, shower, and go about my day, and uh, life just came to a screeching halt. Yeah. So we don't have a lot of time. And they built up a, a very, very simple philosophy, which is for me, the default is always kindness. Mm-hmm. If I can't be kind, I just walk away. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. Okay. So fear often motivates us, right? So fear of like losing jobs or rejection or public speaking, right? But how can the over-dramatization of small fears kind of pigeonhole our lives, right, in the grand scheme? Well, you get boxed in. Uh What fear does is just box you in and and prevents you from taking chances and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Uh, It just just pretty much, and and then you said the words, you you get pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a self-imposed prison. Mm -hmm. There's nobody has... There's nobody holding bars up or you're holding the bars up yourself. Yeah. And so being able to understand uh, that fear, that fear response, and that it's it's basically a, a choice, right? Mm-hmm. Life is just a series of choices and decisions. Yeah. That moment by moment, you're just making the wrong choice mm-hmm. based on fear. And you, if you keep doing the same thing you're doing, you're going to keep getting the same thing you're getting. So yeah. yeah. Overcoming that fear is just choosing differently, it's making a different decision. Yeah. And then going going with that. But uh, the underlying theme of, of many coaches, it's not just people, but many coaches' lives, is fear. Mm. Right? It's fear of losing the job. It's yeah. fear of, hey, who's a new guy? He's really young. He's got three masters and a PhD. Yeah. It's, that induces fear. Yeah. And I just got assigned golf. And I was a tennis guy. Yeah. I don't know anything about golf. That's fear. Yeah. And the AD said they're cutting three positions. There's 10 of us. Is that one of, that's that one of those guys? Me. Mm. That's fear. Mm. And so when you start living from that point of view of life, is is life gets burdensome, uh, and you suffer. Yeah, yeah. And when you start to understand that you don't really control anything, mm-hmm. uh, then you start to be able to live from a different perspective. And that's something that I learned out there is I didn't really control anything. He did. Yeah. All I control whether I was would kind of drown or, or, or be eaten by a great white. It's not mm-hmm. really good choices, right? Yeah. Well, they both kind of are, are pretty bad choices. Mm-hmm. But. Um, I overcame that fear, and I thought, well, I'm gonna, if I'm going to perish here, I'm going to perish fighting. And, and, and uh, I've never really been that kind of guy. Mm-hmm. I'm a jiu-jitsu guy, but I don't learn jiu-jitsu because I want to go and choke somebody out. I <laughs> learn jiu-jitsu because I wanted to learn uh, a little bit about myself and withholding back some of that anger and redirecting some of the anger that I had. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a young guy, as we all have, when you're young and you know, kind of stupid and think <laughs> you know everything. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't really about fighting. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't that. It was really I wanted to redirect, uh, you know, this this anger, this fear that I had into something more positive. Yeah. Uh, it, it was an amazing experience, mm-hmm. uh, for sure. That's interesting. Okay. And then I heard this idea of, of a circumbivalence, right? So it's the idea that our interests kind of change at key points in our lives in order to help us progress to a higher level. Um, so I just wanted to get your take on it and, and see what your thoughts were on that. Well, that's, that reminds me of a little bit about what we talked about. You know, when you start, you're you're okay with taking that that job at mm-hmm. you know twenty two thousand dollars or whatever. You're single, you could live with roommates, and but as you start growing and, and developing as a coach, that yeah. no longer serves you. Yeah, uh, it's it's you, you realize that you have more value mm-hmm. uh, that you can add to the world, and you yourself bring some more value to the table. So you start changing. Yeah, but th- those you know, I don't remember the. Uh, the phrase, but it has to do with, you know, when I was a child, I played with toys, but as I grew up, you know, those, those interests, those toys didn't mm-hmm. interest me anymore. And that's, I think that that's a great metaphor for what you just yeah. said is we change, we change as individuals. Mm. And what brought me, um, a lot of excitement and joy as a coach when I started mm-hmm. was getting people bigger, faster and stronger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My evolution as a coach changed where now I just want to make a connection. Yeah. I can make a connection with a human being. Yeah. My goal has always been to coach so that you don't need me anymore at some point in time. It's not to keep you as a client mm-hmm. uh, and, and keep making money off of you. No, yeah. it's to build a connection and 
ask you, how can I serve you? What, what can I do for you yeah. versus what can you do for me? So that evolution changes. Uh, you don't have that mindset when you get on because you're just thinking about, I need a job. Your yeah. fear is I need a job. I just got went to school. I got a master's or not. I, I need a job. I need, you know, you apply to 10 schools and the one school you don't want to go mm-hmm. is the one that hires you. But the fear is nobody's going to hire me. So I'm going to go here. Yeah. And you just kind of go with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, you, you change from that to what else can I offer? And I, I think at some point you cross over into thinking about leaving a legacy. Yeah. Especially if you have a family, you know, what else can I do? Mm-hmm. How else can I do it? How can I serve people? And how yeah. can I be a better human being? Again, goes back to, to my philosophy of be kind. And if you can't be kind, then walk away. Yeah. And that, that's not the way it was when I was young. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you know, I want to throat punch you. <laughs> Yeah, that's not the way to live. Yeah, that's not a way to build relationships and connections. Mm-hmm. But you learn, you know, you grow and you learn and uh, it changes who and what you are. And your perspective on life changes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get you. OK. And then moving forward right on this kind of while we're on the topic of philosophy. Right. So um, what is your take on like essentialism, existentialism, like nihilism, faith and kind of how that all shapes how we look at the world and how we coach. Right. So so what does that mean to you? It's really simple. Is mm-hmm. you are the master of your own fate. Mm. Uh, it goes back to what I just said: is life is a series of choices, yeah. a series of decisions. And I've never believed that there's a uh, that you you made a mistake. Uh-huh. Right? You really simply made a wrong choice. And if you didn't like it, then choose again differently the next time. Yeah, it is it's a very simple way to live. It's a very simple way to think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you you. You have. I'm a firm believer that you have free will, regardless yeah. of what your beliefs are. Is you have free will, and you have the ability to uh, produce the world around you. The way you produce the world around you is the choices that you make. Yeah. You know, right versus left. Uh, I ate the burger versus you know the chicken and and veggies. It's yeah. it's just choices. And mm-hmm. Those choices and have consequences. But if you don't like the consequences mm-hmm. of that because of that free will and that free choice, then you choose again and you choose differently. And that way it allows you to live in a manner that you're not afraid to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I think my life changed when I realized that, um, I didn't have to know everything in certain conditioning. Yeah. Uh, uh, at some point, you know, you, you can't read every book. You can't go to every course. You you just can't know everything. It's impossible, Mm -hmm. but that's a fear I had. Yeah. And the moment I started to realize that, that there were just choices. And if I didn't make the right choice, um, I can make another choice. And if yeah. that didn't pan out, I can still make another choice. It, it really taught me to live from a position where um, I wasn't afraid to make decisions. I wasn't afraid to make choices. It was just life is just a series of choices and decisions. Mm. That's it. Yeah. No more complicated than that. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Okay. And then moving forward a little bit, right? So um, there's a lot of talk about epigenetics and, and kind of gene expression. And I recently read this um, article, or I think it was an article. Basically saying, so I read two, right? one says epigenetics, right? So our, basically who we're going to become is kind of, we can't really change that, right? Because our, our genes are, are set a certain way. And so no matter what, they're going to they're gonna transcribe in that way and we're going to become that person, right? And then this other idea of we can come kind of control who we become and how our genes express by what we um, put ourselves in the company of, right? So what's your kind of take on that? You are not your biology. Mm. It's really simple for me. Okay. You are not your biology. You can influence your biology. Mm-hmm. Yes, your DNA is sort of kind of set. But yeah. Even uh, uh, I would say that there's there's people that would argue that point, mm-hmm. and you can influence that biology uh, via nutrition. Yeah. Uh, meditation. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, just quiet time. Yeah. Uh, reduce load, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you, you you're certainly um, you're certainly prescribed through your DNA some some good and some bad stuff. And uh, an example is I, w- I went to my doctor and um, she did the um, Alzheimer's test on me. Mm-hmm. Which is you know just basically which which one of the variants do you have that predisposes you to Alzheimer's? And you have one that's ten to twenty, you have one that's thirty to forty, and you have one that's ninety percent. So mm-hmm. I had the one that was thirty to forty. Mm-hmm. So she said, you didn't necessarily win the lottery. Yeah. You, didn't, you, you weren't at the front of the line, but you're not at the back of the line either. Mm-hmm. And so I said, what, what does that mean? And she said, well, 
uh, it means that you have a 30 or 40 percent chance of getting Alzheimer's. But the good thing is that you're in here. And the way she described it is she had between 15 or 20 patients that were in the 90th kind of percentile, and uh, not a single one had developed Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is through proper nutrition supplementation, she was able to ward off a lot of those symptoms, yeah. that decline in brain and cognitive status. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a in-your-face, you're-not-your-biology kind of lecture to me, and I realized that, uh, that my my DNA is my DNA is my DNA. So mm -hmm. I didn't inherit the best DNA when it came to that. Yeah. But I can influence it, and I can certainly hopefully stave off some of the 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 bad and negative side effects from it yeah. through good decision making. Again, mm -hmm. life is a series of choices and decisions. Yeah. Uh, eating better, mm -hmm. uh, making sure I take care of myself, quieting the mind. Those things, I think, uh, will influence the fact that uh, I'm not going to be my biology. Mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. And then moving forward into this last segment here, right? just a few questions, kind of more about you personally as a person. Um, what are some quotes that you live by, if you have any? Um. Uh, the first thing I heard and the last thing I heard when I left Nebraska was Boyd Epley said, um, the great ones adapt. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really think about it too much then, but it, it was really life-altering because every single decision I've made to go forward in, in different areas of life, it's, it's, it's about adaptability, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. If I go from uh, Fort Lauderdale to you know somewhere up in Wyoming, Montana, where – Winter is probably eight months out of the year. Yeah. Um, probably not the best decision for a guy from Fort Lauderdale, mm -hmm. but there's adaptability there, right? Yeah. You're going to have to adapt to that, and you're going to have to do something because if that's the job that you want and that's where it's at, yeah. you're going to have to adapt to it. doesn't yeah. mean you're going to have to like it, mm -hmm. but we certainly have the ability to adapt. If, if, you're, if you're a football guy and you get assigned basketball, well, mm -hmm. guess what? You're going to have to adapt to basketball. Yeah. Uh, that means make some phone calls to guys who are actually doing basketball to kind of give you some direction. I have no idea what I'm doing, yeah. but give me some direction. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've always, I've always, always um, thought that that was, I, I didn't really understand it at the time. Uh, I didn't really think I was adapting much, but I've done nothing but adapt after that time. Is is sometimes daily, right? You're adapting to things. So mm -hmm. the great ones adapt. I've always thought that that was, one of the best quotes I've ever uh, I've ever heard. Mm, okay, is there a thought or experience from your past that you've kind of held on to that's made a big difference in your life now? Yeah, the the experience of walking on, which okay. was a hellacious experience. It was <laughs> it's absolutely awful. Yeah. Um, you know, I walked on with three hundred people. There was no way they were going to be able to take three hundred people. The the program was meant to essentially cut down everybody uh, and, and be able to get maybe one or two people to keep positions that they needed. And, yeah. You know, I was that guy that just didn't go away. Yeah. Uh, I, I could not get beaten. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, uh, I, I kind of made it a point where uh, someone told me, you know, you're, you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. And I made it a challenge. It was, I, I knew I was not going to make it. Yeah. I mean, There's no there's no question in my mind I was not going to make it. I, didn't, I had the height, didn't have the weight, didn't have the skills. Yeah. But the moment that someone said to me, right to my face, point black, you know, you're not going to make this kid, might as well leave now. Yeah. Uh, it became a challenge, and I ended up being one of only two guys that made that. Mm -hmm. So that experience changed me many ways, uh, primarily in realizing that, you know, you, you have more than you think you have. Yeah. I, I pulled out stuff from inside of me that, you know, existed there simply because I was just not going to be denied some by someone who said I didn't have it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, I mean, that's, big you know um what is the best advice you've ever been given best advice um i would go back to uh, that, that probably in our conversation that you know life's just a series of choices mm -hmm. uh that that's really really changed my life yeah and allow me to realize that it's it's just every moment is just decisions and choices yeah and sometimes we make good choices, sometimes we don't, but we can always keep changing. You're not, you're not set based mm -hmm. on the choice that you made. And if you are, then you, you make a different choice next time. That's really allowed me to live from a point where there's, I, just have, I just have no fear, mm -hmm. none whatsoever. Yeah. And uh, it's powerful. Wow. That's very freeing, honestly. Um, <laughs> I mean, I love it. So 
I'm going to take that from you if, if you if you don't mind. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then what is the worst advice you've ever been given? Uh, do what you love and the money will follow. Mm. That's BS. Yeah. <laughs> I give you I give you strength and conditioning. Right? Yeah, right. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, so do what you love and the money will follow. No. Create opportunities where others have it and the yeah. money will follow. That's, mm. that's big. That's a good business. That's a huge business tip. You know, nobody mm-hmm. nobody's really thinking like that. So that's very important. And I really like that point. So thank you for that. Um, and then the last question here, right? So what projects are you currently working on and how can people reach out to you and follow your journey? Um, I'm working on a coach's uh, biological base camp. Okay. Which uh, it's essentially the premise is kind of really simple. Mm-hmm. And the best way to describe it is you, you learn, learn how to take care of your biology so you can take the care of the biology of others. Mm. It's really that simple. So it's the, the whole point being we're going to take coaches on, on this adventure, this expedition of developing their biological systems to a point where they understand who, what, where they are. Yeah. And then they can then transfer that to the athletes that they're working with. It just we're, we're trying to make a better coach. Yeah, yeah, no, I love it. And oh. for me, the, the best way to get in touch with me is uh, is Twitter. Okay. So I'm very active on Twitter. I I got on Twitter to share information to be yeah. transparent, mm-hmm. and I've been grateful that many people have been able to do that with me. So, uh, car performance at Twitter, mm-hmm. and that's it. That's that's DM if you have any questions if, I, mm. if there's anything i can do for you uh feel free to dm and i'll follow back and hopefully mm. we'll connect awesome well coach this has been fantastic i, I really appreciate your time i think the listeners are going to get a lot out of it i know i did um so once again thank you for your time and i look forward to connecting again soon in the future i appreciate it thank you thank you very much Juan.